All right, we'll go ahead and start with, we'll open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus. We thank you that he who was without sin became sin for us. We thank you also, God, for the faith that you gave us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, that you gave us that faith, Lord, and that you sustain it through the, your Spirit. We thank you for your word and all of its promises, in the, and we thank you for your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so the word sin means to miss the mark or to uh, miss or wander from the path of, wander from the path is the, the, the meaning of uprightness and honor is the implication. And so it almost sounds like it's a borrowed word, you know, like maybe it comes from sports or something when you hear miss the mark, but it is not, it is not a borrowed word. The word sin is always used in the context of morals or ethics. So this implies that the mark, when it says miss the mark, or the path is a standard of morality or behavior that it's talking about. That's what sin is always talking about. I have an illustration, this illustration right here, of a dartboard. And on the dartboard, there is a center target called the bullseye. Um, in most dart games, that's what the contestants aim for, right? The bullseye. There's other games, baseball and, and around the world, but, our, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting sidetracked. Our moral bullseye is perfection. And so that's why the word perfection is that. No sin. That's the bullseye as far as uh, making the mark uh, as far as sin concerns. Now here's an illustration of a second dartboard. Now you'll notice that the second dartboard still has perfection in the middle. But on the outside are various sins that someone might commit. And this is how the world sees sin. The worst sins are way on the outside of the board. You really miss the mark if you're doing those things, right? And then there's some less destructive sins, maybe ones that, oh, you know, everyone does those or whatever, are on the inside, really close to the mark. Some really miss the mark on the outside, and some just kind of miss the mark. That's how the world sees sin. But let me ask you this. Think about this. Where would Jesus be on this board? If he were aiming, what would he hit? He, exactly, right. Would he ever even be in the second circle? No, he wouldn't. So we can take this even further. In the Garden of Eden, before sin, where would Adam and Eve land on this board? Adam and Eve would never even be in the second circle. Once again, only in the middle. They were completely without sin until they disobeyed. So that is the standard. Perfection is the standard that we as humans were originally designed for. We're in um, the middle. We're actually in chapter 3 of a study on Galatians. Uh, this week is um, about the power of faith and the futility of the law. And I'm going to go ahead and start reading in verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So there is a profound principle in this phrase that's used at the beginning of the chapter, and that, that, that phrase is to obey the truth. Let's think about that for a minute. Obey, you're obeying the truth. Last week in our group discussion, actually, we talked about what motivates us to do good works and holy living. If we're, if we're living by faith and it's not to meet some standard, what is it? When we talk about obedience as a Christian, it is by faith. We're not obeying a rule or a commandment. Obeying the truth means doing things because we believe they are really true. Um, a great example of this is the, the law of gravity. Gravity is interesting. Do we obey it because it's a law? Oh, there's the law of gravity. You better obey it. No, it can't be seen, actually, and it, can, it cannot be completely scientifically explained. It's something that's actually just by experience. But we believe in the law of gravity because of genuine faith. As a result, we don't wake up in the morning and wave our arms around and expect to be able to float over to the dresser or the bathroom as we get ready for our day, right? Like we're in a space capsule. We know that that law of gravity exists, and it's going to impact our, our life and our behavior. So in the same way, the works we do as a Christian believer are works of faith. And they're an outcome of that faith. 
we truly believe there's a living God who loves us and wants the best for us, so we behave accordingly. We truly believe that Jesus rose on the third day, conquering sin and death, and we share our faith because we truly believe that that is the way people need to know God. It's not because we're compelled to earn points with God or to justify ourselves in front of God. The same faith that saves us is why we live the Christian life that we live. Um, Hebrews 11.56 tells us something else that's really important about faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently uh, seek him. Think about what a big statement that is. Impossible. It's impossible to please him, not improbable. It's not difficult to please him. It is impossible to please God without faith. So faith is absolutely the basis of our salvation and our resulting obedience to Christ is obeying the truth around it. Uh, Jesus made this very clear how important faith was in Matthew 8, 5 through 13. Most of you have probably heard this story. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. So faith is the one thing we find in the Bible that amazes Jesus. Or one of the two things. I, the next one's coming up. Not the greatness of the temples. His disciples tried to say, oh, look at, look at the temples, Jesus, and, and how great they were. That didn't amaze him. Not the power and the position that Centurion had. That didn't amaze him. Just faith. And it says he marveled at him. What does he say the result of such faith is? Many will come from the east and west that is outside of Israel, non-Jewish people, and be in the kingdom of heaven. But look at what else Jesus marveled about. It happened in his own hometown. Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. So Jesus marveled at someone's faith, and he also marveled at a town's lack of faith. And what's the result of no faith? They'll be cast into outer darkness. Jesus doesn't give a lot of room for mo no faith. You don't see him saying, it's okay that you don't believe a lot. Only, only one example where the man told him, Lord, help my unbelief. But other than that, really, he expects faith from people because it's, a, it's his character. You're saying, what is the character of God? What do I believe about God? This next, the next point of the letter, almost obvious. Um, having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? We don't receive the Holy Spirit by works, or good deeds, we can't earn our way to salvation, and in the same way we can't earn our way to spiritual gifts. So no wonder Paul, the one who's writing this letter, is heartbroken over this issue with the Galatians. It must have been amazing to see those people originally receiving the gospel by the Spirit with no anticipation of a Messiah in their mind. They didn't know who the Messiah was. Um, completely receiving the gospel by the Holy Spirit. And twice regarding this, Paul calls them foolish in this letter. He says it two times, just for giving up so easily what they had gained. Um, we'll move on to verse 6. It says, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So from verse 8, we learn two things. The first thing we learn is that Abraham was justified by faith. And the second is that the gospel was preached to Abraham beforehand, um, even before the loss. He was not Jewish. He was from the Chaldees, 
Ur of the Chaldees. It was an advanced civilization with completely separate beliefs from the God of the Old Testament. And like the pre-Christian Galatians, they, Chaldeans believed in many gods. This is a, um, do we have that picture? This is a lizard-headed goddess from ancient Ur. This is Abraham's hometown before God, God called him out and called him to faith. Um, it's now on display in the Iraq Museum. So they, were, they, were, they believed in multiple gods, they were pantheists, and that's where Abraham was from. So God called him out of the land to a completely different place and revealed himself to him. He promised him offspring and promised him that all nations would be blessed by him. Look at this chart. This is interesting because the Jewish people are the sons of Abraham. We hear, that, we hear the Pharisees and all the leaders talking about the sons of Abraham. Abraham was not Jewish. He came out of a polytheistic society, multiple gods. Um, he, had, he heard the gospel, and he followed it by faith. The Galatians were not Jewish, came from a polytheistic society, heard the gospel, and followed God by faith. So Abraham, who is the father of the Jewish nations, actually has more in common with the Galatians than he does those who were under the law. And in other verses, it promised him that he would be a light to many nations and that his offspring would be like the stars of heaven. And this alludes to the idea of a spiritual offspring. And maybe this is what was meant by the gospel was preached to Abraham. I don't know. On the other hand, it's very possible that he heard the whole gospel, that the entire gospel, including the revelation of Jesus, was preached to Abraham. Um, John 8, 56, Jesus tells us, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. So just as the prophet Daniel uh, was read, was shown many things and told, he was told to seal it up rather than to um, write it down. In the same way, Abraham may have been told things by God that are not revealed in the Old Testament account of his life. Um, it could be that Abraham knew a lot about who God was because in Hebrews 11, it says, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So he was told to sacrifice Isaac, and for some reason he understood that God could resurrect him, that he could obey God, and he could trust God all the way to the point of resurrection, to raising him from the dead. Let's go ahead and look at what it says about Abraham and his faith and how it was credited to him for righteousness. Um, Romans, this is in Romans, for we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? Um, this, this, uh, listen to this carefully. While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? So just to give you some background, Abraham... Uh, did the first ritual that became part of the Jewish law, which was, which was circumcision. But he was actually called by God before that. So not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he re received the sign of circumcision that he might be the father of all those who believe. Though they are uncircumcised, the righteous might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also walk in the steps of faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. For the promise that he would be on the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So one thing we can be sure about God is that he keeps his promises. God's faithful, even when we're not faithful. His um, word tells us that, and he keeps his word. He didn't justify Abraham by faith. He called him and justified him, um, I'm sorry, by, he, by, by the law. He justified him by faith. So he didn't um, justify him by faith just to tell him, um, the rules have changed. You're no longer justified unless you're circumcised. How are the obedient then in the Old Testament saved? They are saved through faith. They're not saved by the law. Even though we have this whole Old Testament law, that's not how they're saved. Verse 9 in Galatians says, So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law, or do them. That, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. So in plain language, whether it says curse, you know, people are cursed under the law. If we try to be justified by the law, you have to be perfect. And it goes back to the beginning, to our dartboard example. We were designed to be sinless. So only the bullseyes count. Only perfection counts. 
Verse 10 is a quote from the law itself that tells everyone that um, they are cursed if they don't continue in all the things written in the book of the law. Sounds horrible, doesn't it? It sounds like, wow, this is hopeless. We can't possibly do this. So what is the harm then of the Galatians trying to be justified by the law? They're no longer living by faith and they no longer are justified by faith. They're trying to be justified in a way that we know is impossible. So, um, verse 12, yet the law is not of faith, but of but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Though it is only a man's covenant, yet it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should be made, that it should make the promise of no effect. So God made a promise to Abraham 430 years before this law was even written. And that promise was that um, the blessings would come to his seed. Um, In verse 16, what Paul is pointing out is that the promise is to only one offspring. And that one offspring is referring to Jesus. It's referring to, um, it's referring to um, Isaac and, um, and Jacob and the tribes of Israel and Judah, but eventually to Jesus. If it were to have said, and to all your offspring, everyone, everyone in the family, or this promise is made, that would mean that there could be many different offspring of Abraham and many different schools of thought about what could lead to fulfillment of the promise. Maybe there'd be some descendants of Ishmael, who was um, Isaac's half-brother, with a slightly different understanding of God that would be entitled to that promise, you know, because it's all of them. Or maybe there'd be some descendants of Esau, who was Jacob's twin brother, who gave away his inheritance by lack of faith. And he might have a different version of that promise as well. Or maybe there'd be different versions of the promise to each of the different tribes of Israel, each with their own interpretation of how much of the law they need to obey. But we know that that's not the case because it tells us that there's a single offspring that that promise was made to, and that offspring leads to Jesus and Jesus only. Only Jesus justifies and completes the whole law and therefore lifts this curse from people who are trying to live under the law. Let's read in verse 18. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not, for if there had been a law given that could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Uh, Verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. And after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So verse 21 tells us that if a law had been given that could have given a life, if people could have been saved by the law, um, righteousness would have been by the law. You know, that's something you find um, in, the, in the whole Bible. You have innocence, you have Adam and Eve, and um, it, you know, people, some, somebody might object to God's justice. They might say, what about if you just made everyone so they didn't have sin? You know, put them in a perfect environment. Okay, well, we see what happened. They disobeyed anyway. And then you had this period of like uh, just uh, the, the patriarchs, you know, just living under faith. And you know, what if people just lived under faith and there was no kind of... Um, 
law, you know, and then you see all, Abraham actually did a lot of things that weren't that great, but he still was justified by faith. And it's like, okay, well, what if you gave everybody all the rules they needed to follow, you know, and then that was how they, 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 could, they could good their way to heaven. And we see that that doesn't work. We see that that leads to a curse because people can't follow it. So all of these different ways that people are trying to be justified all reveal to them that only Jesus can, um, only Jesus' payment for their sin can justify us. The law was not sufficient to save us. Jesus had to be crucified, and that's why he had to become our, um, he had to become our righteousness. So what is this saying about the law? God's the one who wrote the law. He gave it to Moses, the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Is it saying that the law is a bad idea? Or that, that God came up with a better idea later on? You know, oh, that didn't work out. I better do something different. We already know that's not true because of the promise of the gospel that was given to Abraham 430 years before the law. Um, we know that from the beginning of time, God had intended to redeem mankind through Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, why was there ever a law? Why even do this in between? You know, why waste the time if that's, you know, in human perspective? The end of this chapter actually tells us precisely what the purpose of the law was. There's three things. The first, number one, it did not cancel the covenant given to Abraham, but it was put in place as a mediator until the promise came fulfilled. A mediator is something, someone who negotiates between two parties. So you have the wrath of God, God actually um, is, um, is holy, and man has become unholy and disobedient. So in order to avoid God's wrath, you have this mediator. And, and at the time before Jesus, that mediator was the law. Um, and the Holy Spirit didn't dwell in the hearts of believers before Jesus. It couldn't because our hearts were not righteous enough to have the spirit of the living God of the universe in the middle of them. Think about that. If you are a believer, you actually have that same presence of the Holy Spirit that was in the temple that led the people of Israel like a, uh, as a pillar of fire at night and as a cloud during the daytime. That actually came into all the believers after Jesus made our hearts righteous. That should really affect your life, right? But I, I'm digressing. Uh, the point is that the Holy Spirit didn't dwell in the hearts of the believers, so they couldn't obey the law. The law was, or they couldn't just understand right and wrong and do it. The law was added because of sins as a guide for people to live by. So that's the first thing. That's the first reason we had to have the law. The second one is in verse 23. It tells us that the law was put in place to protect. There's a lot of like cleanliness laws and you know laws about certain foods to eat like that a lot of that was protection but it's even deeper than that it's protecting them it's giving them a boundary so that they don't they don't self-destruct you know it would be like it would be whatever you think's right just do it you know that's great you know it's great not be a loving parent in the same way God gave his people a law so that it would protect them. Um, number three, the number God had a private tutor who would lead God people to Christ where they would be justified by faith. So the law was put in place to protect people and to, um, and to mediate between God, but also to teach them that they couldn't follow it. Isn't that weird? Could you imagine having a teacher who says, you're not going to be able to do everything that I tell you to do? You know, actually, that would be a good teacher. You should have a teacher that knows more than you, so that makes sense in a way. But um, this was even more profound. The whole, you know, the, the, it's basically deliberately teaching the people that they cannot be justified by this law that is given to them. In verse 26, we go right back to the problem that was presented to the Galatians that de deceived them in the first place. Um, they are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And just as circumcision, we learned in Romans, that was an outward sign of faith. What they were doing was they were starting to try and follow the whole law. If you weren't with us from the beginning, they were trying to uh, eat the right foods and some of them were getting circumcised. They were, you know, following all the festivals and all the laws of the Jewish people um, in order to be complete Christians. And um, we learned 
um, in Romans that uh, the circumcision was an outward sign of faith that already existed and the righteousness had already been given to God because of that faith. Um, baptism is the same way for a believer. It's actually instructed, but it's uh, to do as a believer, but it's an outward sign. It is not our salvation. All of us became heirs to something that was promised to one offspring. We're Christ, and because of that, we are heirs to the promise of a single offspring. So next week, we're going to learn that even people of faith before Christ were, was revealed were heirs to that same promise. We talked about it a little in this chapter, but we're going to learn a little more about how they fit into that promise. For now, let's just be happy that we're all the same through faith, not through obeying the law and not being born to a certain group of people and not for obeying specific rituals that you know only we have been taught. There's no way we can do better than the righteousness that Jesus gave to us. I'm going to close in prayer, but I'm going to, before I do that, talk about our discussion questions this week. Um, discussion questions are, share something that you did based on your faith. How did it turn out, and how did it make you feel? That's just kind of an open question for sharing. Um, how does the dartboard concept of missing the mark affect your perspective of sin? The next is, discuss the concept of obeying the truth as mentioned in the passage. How do you distinguish between obeying out of faith and obeying out of obligation? And the last one, you know, how do we take this outwardly? How can we effectively share the message of justification by faith with those who might believe that adherence to the rules is what makes them righteous? Um, probably we're putting it in plainer language now you think about it, not just telling people, you can't be justified by faith, you know, find a better way to say it than I did. Anyway, let's close in prayer and then we'll have our, our discussion group. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your law. We thank you, God, because it showed um, your holiness, God. It showed your, um, it showed you the, the Father's heart that you have. You have. It's a mediator, Lord, even when we couldn't measure up to you, the heart to teach us, God. We thank you for all those things. We thank you now, God, that your Holy Spirit is our teacher and that your word um, through your Holy Spirit uh, gives us um, teaching beyond what we ever could have had without the justification um, of our sins by your Son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.